There's a, wow, it's a great crowd. Thank you for inviting me. This is the fourth time I'm here. The first time I came, I just lied and said things were going to be really good. And I kept with that for years and it worked. But now I've got to tell you the truth. And unfortunately, the truth today is not quite as nice as the lies of yesterday. The general gist here that I want you to understand is the economy is fundamentally slowing. But there's no reason for us to have a recession. This notion of we're going to have a recession because we're late in the cycle and we're due, and it's going to happen this year, is a crock of crap, okay? It may happen, but I really don't think it will, and I'll tell you why I don't think it will, and I'll tell you why it could, and I'll tell you the signs to look for. So let's begin and see where we are. Q2 GDP, so that's just a couple quarters ago, was 4.2 or 4.3 percent. It was great. It was the best quarter we've had in a long time and the peak of this business cycle. Q3, 3.5 percent. Q4, that just ended a couple weeks ago, 3 percent, upper twos. The quarter right now is hard to know because of the government closure, but 2.2 or 2.3. You can see the trend. You don't need a PhD in economics. You don't. We're slowing. This year, 19, we're going to grow at 2.4, 2.3. But we grew last year, 2018, at 3%. This is a 20% slowdown. There'll be meaningful decline in the rate of growth. We're growing, but more slowly. Let's see why. So C, the first term in GDP, is excellent. Job growth is good, pay growth is good, and unemployment is super low, workers are happy, they're spending their money, they're buying all kinds of stuff. It's going to remain solid as long as job growth is good, follow job growth. Next, government spending, G, is still stimulative this year, but less than last year. So we're going to slow a little bit in G. I is corporate investment in plant and equipment. It's going to slow a little too. Nothing traumatic, nothing dramatic, but a little bit slower. And the last term is exports. It'll probably do better than we think because the dollar's not going to go up so much, because interest rates aren't going to go up so much, because the central bank is thoughtful and they're not going to raise rates inappropriately. So last year we had strong C and strong I and strong G and decent net exports. This current year, just as strong here, weaker there, weaker there, and flat there. So we're going to slow. But there's no reason we're going to have a recession. Recessions happen because of bad things happening, mistakes occurring, policy errors. It could happen, but I just don't see it for this year. I think the likelihood of a recession in 2019 is double what it was last year. It was about 12 to 15 percent. Now I think it's more like 25, 28 percent. Higher, but not high. If it gets above 40 or so, that's when I start to get an economic rash all over my body and I get nervous. But we're okay. We really are. So let's have a look here. This is what you're seeing and this is the crux of the story. Notice, this is consumer sentiment, confidence, put up by the confidence board. You can see this lovely series that goes straight up, and then that. And here's expectations, and then that. So, do you focus on the this, or do you focus on the that? You focus on both, and you say to yourself, gee, consumer ha confidence levels or expectations are very high, but they're down a bit. That's okay, because GDP he is slowing, growth is slowing, corporate profits are declining, the stock market hasn't done so well, global trade is slowing, China is slowing, Japan is slowing, Europe is slowing. No kidding we're not quite as happy as we were. The government is closed. Those are ample reasons to be a little bit less than ecstatic. But at these levels, this is still a stupendously high level. It could fall to here, here and I'd be happy. So we're way happier than we have to be to have a decent economy. I'm a poet, how about that? Who knew, right? We're okay. My title, I think, if I go back here a little bit, if I go back a slide or two, instead of saying terrific, turbulent, or tepid, maybe it could have been slowing but growing. How does that sound? 
that's really, you know, look here, here again, small business confidence. It's high, but it's down of late. Hey, that's okay. Our economy was growing at 2.2% here. As long as we don't get to here or something, we're fine. We could fall 10 points and be fine, thank you very much. That's why I'm saying it's too bad we're not as happy as we were, but we're still happy enough to have a decent growth economy in 2019. Not as good as last year, but no recession either, right? Look how we're spending our money. We're going to hotels. Households are taking trips on vacation. Corporations are spending money on corporate travel. I'm not sure why exactly, but that's a whole separate issue. People go, oh, we have a conference, corporate trip, travel to Las Vegas. What the hell? This is like, you know, sending your kid, hey, my daughter, hey, daughter, you want to go to Disneyland to do homework? I mean, what kind of stupid act does that? If this also means, by the way, people have time to have a little nookie on the side, you know, they're going to hotel rooms for, you know, an hour or two or something. Now, you might say this is morally reprehensible, but as, as real estate agents, you think this is good because it creates divorces, two households, not one, <laughs> more legal bills, the, the attorneys are happy, the courts are happy, hotels are happy, smaller apartments are happy. This is a frivolous purchase. No one has to go to on vacation, right? We're buying cars. This is amazing, actually, because interest rates have been dribbling up over the last several years. Zero interest financing is no longer really available, right? But yet we're buying cars. Cars have been solid. We broke a rec the record all-time high was 2016, 17.2 million cars. This past year, 17 million. So we've, we've peaked a year or two ago, but we've remained above 17 million units. Is that down from 17.2? Yes. Will this year be probably 16.9? Yeah. Is that down? Yes, but are we unhappy? No. It's like today, I only could take three drags of marijuana, not four. Am I high? Yeah, I'm not as high as I was, but I'm still pretty high. <laughs> this is okay, right? Keep the perspective here. You know, down a little, but not down. Remodeling is doing well. Renovations, alterations, and repairs are strong because there's no friggin' homes to buy. So I'd like to get a new home, but I can't. No house to buy, so I'll live in the house I have, even though it's not what I really want. But if I spend enough money, I'll make it good. It's like putting lipstick on a pig, you know? It could be okay. It's kind of like that song by Crosby, Stills, and Nash. You know a song, if you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with? It's a terrible song, I know. But it's like, I, I don't like my house, but for enough money, I can like my house. That's what's going on here. And you can see here, the decline is taking place. Look at growth. A year ago, we had growth of 7.5% in renovations, alterations, and repairs. Now it's down to just 6.6. That's down, but still plenty good. Total dollars spent go up from a year ago, 330 to 350 billion bucks. That's okay, as opposed to 357 billion. I mean, come on. This is plenty good enough. Our economy's fine. We're buying friggin' half million dollar race horses. What else says you're happy than buying a stupid horse, right? I mean, this is pretty good news. You put it together, the first term in GDP, C, is growing at, look, 3%. This is 68% of GDP. If it's growing at 3%, it's almost impossible to have a recession. The rest of it must be really in the can to get GDP really awful. Why? Because job growth is good. We're creating last year 2.6 million jobs. We'll talk about it in detail. Wage increases are up 3.2% year over year. That means pay packet, total pay, going to American workers collectively is up over 5%. So workers are happy as the blazes. They're spending money like it's, they're running out like, 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 like selling hotcakes or you know a land office 100 years ago, right? This is good. Now, second term in GDP, I, corporate investment, it's flagging a little bit. Why? Oil prices. If you live in Colorado, you care about oil. Weld, Greeley, Greeley up there, and then you have natural gas in uh, Mesa County, Grand Junction, La Plata County, and Durango, and so on. Their prices are lower for all of these things, and the U.S. is now a huge producer of oil and natural gas. So when prices decline, 
we're happy as consumers, but the businesses are unhappy. Exploration and production is down, pipeline construction is down, fracking activity is down, building cracker plants is down, refineries are down, that hurts investment. Right now we're okay, but there's a little bit of a downer there, number one. Corporate profits are doing great, but they're coming down. They're coming down, right? Public company corporate profits have been going up by almost 20% a year because of tax cuts. But there's no more tax cuts coming. So corporate profits this year, this year 19, year over year, will grow up by 7 or 8%. Whoops, is that good? It's good enough. It's not a recession to go up by 8%. It's fine. Again, not as good as it was. Yes, things aren't as good as they were. You're never going to be as young as you are right now. Right? I wish I were 10 pounds thinner. I wish I had more hair. But I'm managing somehow fine, thank you very much. Right? I'm not going into a recession here. Things are okay. We could end up in a recession. It's a low probability. Corporate profits are a little lower, so firms are a little less happy. Okay, manufacturing is not so happy anymore. Now, this is just one number, not a trend. And, but it's clearly down. There's no question then why. Profits are lower, cost of money is higher, trade is concerning them, trade wars, the t tariffs on stuff, world is slowing, China is slowing, Europe is slowing. Suddenly manufacturers go, this isn't so great. So they're taking it on the chin harder than most other sectors. But notice that manufacturing went into recession a couple years ago, in 2015, early 16, and then they come out. But that didn't drive us into a recession. Those are recession bars. So manufacturing goes into a small recession, we can live with it because it's just 10, 12% of GDP. How about services? Look at the blue line. It's outstanding. We're happy. We're buying Netflix. We're getting real estate services from places like community bank mortgages that put on this lovely event and so on, right? There's people want services. Services aren't as much affected by tax policy and stuff. You can't say, you can say, hey, the economy's bad. I'm not going to buy a refrigerator this year or a car, right? You can't say, oh, the economy's not good. I'm not going to have cancer today. I'm going to put it off. You don't have that luxury with many services. You got to dry clean your clothes. You got to whatever it is, you know, get some legal services or banking services or whatever. Man, you, so services are fine. Job growth is good, spending is good, consumption is good. That's good enough for me. You put it together, the second term in GDP, I, this is an indicator of I, this is spending on equipment, not plants, but equipment. It's flat, okay. Look, here oil prices collapse, China looks like it's going to collapse, and so on. Spending declines like a rock, but there's no recession. We can withstand some trauma to our economy and not experience a recession. So if manufacturing weakens and firms invest a bit less, that's okay. We'll grow at two, not 2.3, not three. We'll grow less, but that's okay, not a recession. Next, let's talk about G, government spending. This is important, pay attention. In December of 2017, so 13, 14 months ago, Congress passed, passed tax cuts, that's blue. And then in February of 2018, almost a year ago, Congress passed spending increases. $200 billion a year for two years. That's in red. Notice that in 2018, we really enjoyed the upswing from that, right? There was a huge increase, boom, boom, boom. These four big bars were the quarterly increases in GDP because of that. But look at 2019 much weaker impact. It's still above the horizontal axis, right? So it's still stimulative. So you've got consumption that's gonna do as well as it did last year. You've got G, this term, that's not as stimulative as it was last year, but still plenty enough stimulative. With strong C and strong G, or strong enough G, it's hard to get a recession. But look what happens come 2020. You can talk to me afterwards about why, but sequestration rules, budget and sequestration rules, will actually cause fiscal policy to turn contractionary if Trump and Congress can't get together and have a spending increase. 
So 20 is a bit more risky than 2019, but we're fine. We're good to go here this year. We have enough, and we have I, the second term, the investment term. It's not going to flag much, maybe a little, but not enough to matter. Manufacturing may get hurt a bit. Car sales may go down a bit. That's not going to be enough. It'll be okay. Look at trade. Trade is my single biggest fear in the short run because it can do a lot of damage to our GDP very quickly. Right now, GDP is already hurting roughly two-tenths of a point because of the trade policies we've already got. You've got, you know, 25% tariffs on 50 billion bucks of Chinese goods, 10% tariffs on 200 billion more, and on March 1st, if we don't make a deal, there'll be, there'll be more tariffs. That will drive GDP growth down. Fiscal policy will take four-tenths of a point off GDP. Tariffs and trade could knock off two-tenths of a point more. Global slowing in manufacturing knock off one or two more, and you've gone from three or 3.1 to 2.3. That's the story. Is this enough to drive us into recession? No, but what if we have more tariffs on China? What if the free trade deal with Mexico and Canada called USMCA or NAFTA 2.0 doesn't pass? And what if we impose tariffs on Europe on automobiles in the name of national security and they retaliate? Whoa, that's a lot of trade tariff wars. That's a lot of decline in GDP. If we have that, and we have manufacturing, and we have poor exports, and the globe slows more, and the Fed raises rates irresponsibly, we could have a recession. But it's going to take stacking up of a bunch of bad things together to get us there. All right? Here you can see global growth over the last, from 2018 through 21, for the major trading areas, US, Europe, and China, the big three, are all going down. They're not going into recession expectation, but they're clearly weakening. So trade is going to weaken, investment in plant and equipment is going to weaken, exports will weaken, and so on. So we're clearly going to slow, but slowing and recession aren't the same thing. You put it together, this is GDP growth. It's okay. You're going to go from 3% to 2.2 or 2.3. I'm happy with that. That's good enough for me. Remember, outside of this year, 2018, outside of that, since the end of the recession, so this entire period from here, end of the recession till last year, we were growing at 2.2. We're going to go back to that rate of growth. This year, 2018, was a beautifully aberrant, fabulous, drug-induced high. It was phenomenal. We were doing lines like there's no tomorrow. <laughs> Give me that credit card. Razor blade. Oh, yeah, it was good. And it's over now. After the upper comes the downer. That's just the way it is. This is contemporaneous economic data as of last week. There's no recession here. There's a little down. Expectations are a little weaker. But this is contemporaneous data as of January 5th. We're fine. You've got to get to negative one or lower before you have serious problems. And we're not going to have a recession because of inverted yield curve. The yield curve looks like this. The bankers in the room are now going to get very excited. Normally, the longer you out you borrow, one year, two year, five, 10, 20, 30, the more you pay. 1%, 2%, 3%, 4%, 5%. It's longer time borrowing, more pay, higher rate, because the, the lender is taking all kinds of risk. Interest rate risk, credit rate risk, default risk, and on and on. But sometimes the yield curve, instead of sloping up, slopes down. That's called an inverted, it's brilliant, inverted yield curve. Yeah, great words, I know. That means short-term money, borrowing for a year, is more expensive than borrowing for 30 years. Don't think of why it happens, but it happens. Every time it happens, the blue squiggle goes above the red bar. And every time the blue squiggle goes above the red bar, it's followed by a vertical bar. What are vertical bars? Right, the public schools here are good. <laughs> recession, recession, recessions, recession, inversion, inversion, recession, recession. We're damn close to an inversion. The Fed's not going to raise rates in January. They're not going to raise rates in March. They're not going to raise rates in April. If the 30-year Treasury or 10-year Treasury stays as low as it is now at around 2.75%, they're not going to raise short-term rates and get us into an inverted yield curve. 
Because when inverted yield curves happen, happen, think about it. It ain't fun to be a banker and lend money. I can talk to Brendan here. Hey, you want an inverted yield curve? And Brendan says, you know what? Let me get it straight. I got to borrow from my customers at 2% and lend out at 1.5? Eh, not so much fun. So all kinds of bad things happen. The Fed doesn't want to drive us into this inverted yield curve. The inverted yield curve doesn't create a recession. It's an indicator that you're on the verge or going to have a recession because people think the Fed's raising rates too fast. And therefore, they think we're going to get a recession. So the Fed's going to hold back. We'll talk about the Fed in a couple of minutes. And even if we get an inverted yield curve, if you notice, the recession doesn't happen instantaneously. It takes a period of time. Even here, it took like a year to get the recession. That's why I'm telling you, I don't see a recession happening until 2020. The likelihood's low this year because we still have government stimulus, we have good consumers, we have good job growth, and so on and so forth, right? We're okay. Let's talk about labor markets. They're friggin' tight. They're tight like a snare drum, my God, they're tight. Job growth is friggin' amazing. It's amazing. So we peaked out of job growth over four or five years ago of three million, we fall to two, and then miraculously we go from two up to two and a half. Last year, we had 2.64 million jobs created. 2.64. That's the best in four, three or four years. And we're late in a business cycle. That's spectacular. But we don't have a lot of unemployment's running low. How much lower can it get? We're going to run out of people. So look at this graph. The reason we were able to get so many workers out of unemployment into working is we've driven the unemployment rate from 10% to 3.7. It jumped up to 3.9 last month. Why? Not because of bad things, no. It's because of good things. What happened was we got these lazy ass jerks, mostly guys who sit home and play video games all day, and they said, hey, you know what? Let's work. <laughs> Who'd have thunk it, right? So these lazy oafs who live at home and don't work finally said, unemployment's at a 50-year low. Oh, work. So suddenly people enter the labor force and things are good. So we have a little more runway now at 3.9. But you can see, if you look at the graph, the last time unemployment rates were this low, that's the housing boom, no, we're lower. Dot-com boom, no, we're lower. That's 1969. That's friggin' Woodstock. This is <laughs> tripping on acid, right? I mean, no one in this room's old enough to remember that. But this is a 50-year low in unemployment. Now, I want to draw your attention to the blue on the graph. The blue is people who qualify for unemployment. Notice how low it is. It's here. It's on this axis here. We've been below 300,000 now for 200 straight weeks. That's a record. And that piece of data, first-time claims for unemployment, is a leading economic indicator. As long as that stays low, we're good to go. There's no problem. So if you find that your boss is very attractive, or your boss's husband or wife, or son or daughter are attractive, now's the time to make a pass. <laughs> Don't hold back. Go to them and say, hey, I find you beautiful. Do you want to smoke a little together? <laughs> you do? That's awesome. Good, we'll do it together. There's no, there's no cost. Maybe you're a bus driver and you like smoking weed. Do it on the bus with the school kids. <laughs> and if they're rowdy, give them the doobie. Let them pass it around. They're not going to fire you. There's no one to ride the friggin' bus. It, the labor markets are really tight. Look at job quits. They're super high. Look at blue. 2.3% of the labor force quits their job every month. So you're a manager and 30% of your workforce is quitting? That just means you're average. Don't feel bad. It's okay. It's fine. We're quitting jobs more than we did in the housing boom, almost as much as the dot-com boom, because we're feeling friggin' good. The economy's strong. There's work to be had. It's easy to get a job. Wage growth is 3.2. It's not bad. What's the biggest problem small businesses have? 
finding workers, for God's sake. There's no one to hire. It's hard to get workers who are any good. The workers who are available, there's two problems. They don't have an alarm clock, and they can't pass a urine test. It's really inconvenient. That's the problem we have now. We're getting really the lowest level of workers now, but we're desperate for workers. This is a good problem for the economy. It may hurt corporate profits, but it's increasing wages for workers and they'll spend their money and that keeps the economy going. Now you would think there'd be great increases in wages. You'd think 50 year low in unemployment, 20 year low in job quits, 50, 200 weeks in a row, first time claims unemployment below 300,000. You'd think wages would be roaring, right? And you'd be wrong. Wage growth has gone from the upper ones, almost 2%, almost 10 years ago, to now a little over three. This is the best in 10 or 11 years, right? It was here before the recession began in 2007. This is the best we've been since then. But it ain't that great. But there are a couple clear explanations for this. The data is much better than you think. And one of the major reasons is demographics. Turns out people who are old, baby boomers, are retired. People like, like, like you, sir, right there. You look really old. You don't look a day over 80, 85. You look good for your age. So he's a good realtor. He's making you know, half a mil a year. And he's being replaced by you. You're 22. You just finished college. You're starting your career. He's making a half a mil, and you're making 50,000. If you mechanically do this 10,000 times a day retiring, 13,000 times a day entering the labor force, that lowers wages. If you account for this, that 3.2% that we saw here is way better. It's almost four. So wages are going up a little faster than we think. Not super fast, but faster. And the other reason wages are being kept down, or one of the many reasons, is labor productivity stinks. If you're an employer and you want to pay your workers based on what they do, so you make more pizzas per day, you do more loans per hour, you can do more pedicures per week. You can do more haircuts or whatever it is, but we don't. Somehow our labor productivity is flat. We don't make more per hour of whatever good or service we provide. So you can't pay your workers more based on their output, like piece, piecemeal work. You know, you're making gloves or you're building, you're sewing gloves. Well, you're only making 100 gloves a day, now it's 101 gloves a day. So you get a small 1% pay increase. This is keeping down wages. So there's wage growth is occurring. It's the best in 10 or 11 years. The labor market is as tight as it's been in 20 to 50 years. That's why C is good. And it will stay good as long as its job growth is pleasant and good. Now how about inflation? Oddly enough, even though we're late in a cycle, there's not much inflation out there. Look here, this is CPI, this is PCE. This is what the Fed looks at for inflation. A little different than the CPI, a little different, not vastly. And you can see red is core, no food and energy. Blue is headline, including food and energy. And economists like to look at the red because it bounces around less and because food and energy just bounce around because of what? A war or a drought in Australia? I mean, who cares, right? For one year, food's higher, energy's higher for a few months and then it goes back down again. So look here, do you see much inflation in red? I mean, I guess you can see some long-term growth in inflation, sure, but not much. We're late in a cycle, yet inflation's not bad. What gives? The answer, my friends, is China. 20 years ago, China was nothing economically. Now they're the second biggest economy in the world, and they're slowing. And as they slow, the cost of copper and the cost of oil and the cost of aluminum, and the cost of steel, and the cost of cobalt, and the cost of nickel, and the cost of lead all go down. And as their unemployment rate goes up, their wages go down a bit. It affects our wages a little too, because we could always do work there, or India, or somewhere else. So we're not the only player in the world. Our economy isn't the one that sets the price for commodities. It's now China. They're the marginal buyer of everything. Their economy goes up, commodity prices go up. Their economy slows, price of commodities goes down. And you can look at wages, 
Wage is the single biggest thing that firms pay for. It's over 60, 65% of all cost to employee wages, but they're not going up very much. So wage growth is remarkably low. Commodity prices aren't going up. We've seen oil prices fall 30% in the last two months of 2018. So there's very little inflation, a little. But the Fed can take its sweet friggin' time raising rates because interest, because inflation's weak. If inflation starts to go up, then they have to raise interest rates. They have no choice. They can't let inflation get out of the bottle, the G get out of the genie bottle, right? But inflation's mild right now. There's no problem. They can sit on their derrieres and take time. This is a luxury they didn't have in prior recessions because as the U.S. economy got tighter, inflation got worse, wage growth went up, commodity prices increased, and they had to jack up rates to slow the economy down. And now they don't have to do it so much. But I'm still a little nervous about the recession. It's lurking in the back of my mind. Look at this graph. The blue tells us how big our economy can be under ideal conditions, 11 trillion, 14 trillion, 18 trillion dollars. If we're using workers and money and factories optimally. Red tells us where we are. So you can see when there's a recession, red falls down because workers are unemployed, factories get shuttered, and so on, right? And then it catches up. We have a big recession, big gap, and then we catch up. So the news is we have a recession, takes a couple years, but our economy catches up to where it would have been absent the recession. Good. Now, look at the same graph in reverse and say, what are the conditions that exist preceding the recession? Red, actuality is touching potential in blue. Ooh, act, present actual growth exceeds potential growth. Actual growth exceeds potential. Actual exceeds potential. When actual growth exceeds potential growth, that means we're growing bloody fast. And when you grow fast, who gets nervous? The Fed. And when the Fed gets nervous, what do they do? They jack up rates. And towards the end of a long recovery, like here or here, they raise rates too fast, they drive us into recession. But not so fast this time. Traditionally, they raised rates every six weeks. The Fed meets every six weeks at quarterly. And traditionally, when they were in an interest rate rising cycle like they are now, they raised every six weeks. Now they're raising every 12 or 13 weeks, four times a year. They're raising half as fast as they used to raise because the economy just isn't as dynamic as it was. Inflationary pressures aren't there. Wage growth isn't so big. Commodity prices are much more flat than they were even declining compared to where they were because of China. So what's the Fed going to do? Well, first, the answer is obvious. It just depends on the height of the central bank hole. That's it. This is Paul Volcker. He's a tall freaking genius, right? Six foot eight. Rates are high. Of course. Greenspan comes, he's shorter. Bernanke's shorter. Yellen's shorter. Rates keep falling. Powell's taller. Rates go up. What the hell was Trump thinking? This is terrible policy. We needed someone five feet or lower. <laughs> Powell should never have been. It was a colossal mistake. I mean, what can I say? But kidding aside, right now, Fed funds is between two and a quarter and two and a half. People think this is the end of the rate rising cycle. I really don't think it is. I think the Fed's got one or two more hikes this year. I don't know. I don't know. It depends on GDP growth. The magic number is 2.3. If we get much more than 2.3, they're hiking rates. If inflation goes much beyond two, they're hiking rates. If wage growth goes much beyond three and a half, they're hiking rates. If you get all three, they're raising rates twice. If you get none of it, they're raising rates zero. I think we get one or two hikes. This is my most optimistic scenario, by the way, right? So this is the best it gets. And if we're lucky, and if we pray every night before we go to bed, and do good things, and kiss our mothers every night, and help old ladies cross the street, maybe we get, maybe we get one more hike next year and we're done. So the message I want you to give to your clients, or not give to your clients, it's your call here, 
is rates aren't going to get crazy high. The 10-year treasury, off of which 30-year mortgages are based, is not going to go into the friggin' stratosphere. Will it go up a little bit? Yeah. Could we hit five, five and a quarter? Sure, from four and a half where we are now, sure. Is this wildly crazy high? No. By historical standards, this is ridiculously good, right? It's not going to get that high. Now, that said, under the wrong circumstances, if the Fed raises three times and growth doesn't get above 2.3 and inflation doesn't start to go up and wages don't go, and they raise this these three times in a vacuum without those things, even a rate this low could drive us into recession. So under the worst of conditions, rates don't go up much. Ideally, they raise them because the, the economy can withstand it. Potentially, they raise too much and they drive us into recession. But because I don't think the Fed's going to raise rates until June at the earliest, they got six months to look at the data. Hey, our economy is stronger than we thought. We can withstand a little bit of rate hike. It'll be OK. And if they don't see it, they don't raise in June. I think at most they raise twice, once in June and once in December. That gives them five months to do one rate hike. They have a whole calendar year to decide if they want to do a second. They're not going to mechanically invert the yield curve. They're going to be very careful not to hike too much because they see global growth is slowing, China's slowing, Europe's slowing. There's trade issues. The dollar's gotten stronger. There are a lot of headwinds out there. The Fed, and we haven't felt the entire impact of all the head Fed hikes over the last several years because it takes up to 18 months for monetary policy increases to be felt because you refinance things, you buy a new car at these new rates and so on. It takes a long time for the full effect to be felt. So, you know, and then I think, oh, go back one slide, I'm sorry. And then come 2021, under the best of conditions, we're lowering rates. Why? Because GDP growth come 2021 or end of 20 or 20 will be 2% or 1.9 or 1.8. We will revert to our long-term trend, which is just below 2%. If you have 2% or 1.9% GDP growth, you can't possibly have a Fed funds rate of 3 and an 8. It has to come down because our, our economy can't withstand the higher rates. So we'll go up a little bit maybe, and then we'll start to come down again. Because 2019 is still going to be above trend growth, and therefore unemployment will continue to decline from 3.9, 3.7, maybe 3.5 by the end of the year. That's why the Fed might have one. We're lucky two hikes in them. Now, let's talk about housing. Oh my God, the housing market's like a crazy mess, you know? It's a hot mess. Here we had the best year of our economic growth in 10 years, 2018, and the housing market starts to turn over, for God's sake. Look at red. Red's private residential construction, single fam and multifam. Not renovations, not alterations, and not repairs. And it went down. How the hell? It's like, this is a WTF moment, right? It really is. Super economy, low unemployment, good wages, good economy, and housing's in reverse. Great job creation, good household formation. This number should be going up like a rocket. And it goes down. We've got a whole bunch of problems here. Look at the severity of the problems first. Look at single fam in blue. Traditionally, single fam is roughly two, two and a half percent of GDP. It should never have gotten that high to three and a half, but then it collapses to one or half a percent, I'm sorry. It slowly goes up to almost one and a half, Gesundheit, uh, and then it falls down, down, down. Renovations, alterations, and repairs now are almost as big as new construction. Single fam construction is really weak. It should be much better. You know why it's no good? It's because the damn friggin' builders, they can't build a cheap home and make any money. Those entry-level homes, you know, a thousand unit subdivisions on green fields out in the suburbs, they can't build those and make any money. It's uneconomical for them. Here in Denver, in Detroit, in Pittsburgh, in Los Angeles, in New York, in Boston, in Minneapolis, it doesn't matter. They can't make any money at them. Other sectors are okay. Multifam is fine. Broker commissions in dark blue are okay. Not great, but they're okay. But it's single fam that's the problem. And you can see it here. Single fam is in red. It's, it's, it's declining. 
I mean, this, is, this makes you want to cry in your beer. Pass a weed. I mean, you need something to relieve your... I mean, multifam is pretty flat, okay. But this is way too low. We should be 400,000 units higher. We're underbuilding this year, last year, the year before, by 350,000, 300, 400,000 units. We're underbuilt by 4 million units on the single fam side. That's why there's no inventory. That's why prices are going up too much, because the builders can't build low-priced homes. I'm not saying subsidized homes. I'm saying entry-level, cookie-cutter, 1,800 square foot, two bed, two bath, or three bed, two bath, whatever it is, right? Here's the same graph, but now not going back to 1960, but going back to 2000. And you can see multifam roughly flat, maybe a little down, and single fam going nowhere. Friggin' nowhere. A super economy, and it's trending down. Home builder confidence sucks, and so on and so forth. This is by region. You're lucky you are where you are. This is the West. Oh, sorry, that's, that's the West here. Going up, it's okay. House prices are really high. This is the South. It's gangbusters. Don't even think of driving or flying over the Midwest or the Northeast. They stop building homes. It's flatter than a pancake. This makes a pool table look hilly, for God's sake, right? There's no, con you know why? Because no one wants to live there. Why? In the Midwest, it's colder than sin. And in the Northeast, taxes are friggin' high. In the South, weather's good, taxes are low, and houses are cheap. Here, the weather's great. Taxes are generally lower in the West, not the coast, but the intermountain West, right? But the, the Northeast and the Midwest have exactly that much to offer. If you're from there, I'm really sorry, okay? Beat me later. But you can see it. No one wants to move there, right? Look at new home sales. They were doing okay, and then they get weaker. Higher interest rates, no, no, no inventory, and price increases that are going up too much. And you add it together, and eventually you pay the price. A year ago, I came and said, this is unsustainable. We can't have home prices that are much growing up so much faster than wages. It took till June or July for it to happen, but the markets finally began to turn over. This is inventory of new homes, new, not existing, new. And the number's about right. It's 325,000. That's just about the historic ma historical magic number. So the builders are building enough houses at the price points that they're building at. The problem is they don't build anything cheap because they can't make any money. This is a chronic problem. It's a serious problem. And it won't go away because there's, there's code creep, right? All these things that add up. So look at inventory of new homes. Suddenly it skyrockets. So not the units. Number of units is pretty, is okay. But in terms of months of inventory, it goes way up because people are holding back and sales are not doing so. If you go back a couple slides, you can see here, sales do get. So if sales go down and inventory's flat, inventory in terms of months starts to skyrocket. I still see the new market doing fine because job growth is going to be good. So the new market should grow by a little bit, 2 or 3% this year. New sales should be okay. New stars should be flat but fine. It won't go up much, but it won't go down because job growth is good. This is home builder sentiment. It sucks because they're not, they can't build enough homes. They can build fewer homes. Inventories are starting to go up, and they're getting a little nervous. That said, I think this is looking worse than it is. I think it's okay. Job growth is still good. Household formation is good. It still pays to know a builder. Know a builder. It's okay. You aren't taking a big risk. Now, look at the problem with the... This is the problem here. This graph will make you cry. It makes me cry almost every day. I'm, it's so obvious. Look at this. This is painful. 10, 12 years ago, we were building 25,000 homes a month of under 150 or black, between 150 and 200. So that's 50,000 a month of homes under 200,000 bucks. Look at it now. Nothing. That's the problem. Yeah, there's been inflation, input costs are higher. I get it. But you can't take away 40,000 homes a month and not have a problem. This is the crux of the problem. At the low end, builders have stopped building. Until this problem gets rectified, we have a systemic, you know, long-term problem here, right? 
prices are too high because all the builders can build and make money on are move up homes. There's plenty of move up homes, you know, 3,000 square feet, four bathrooms, five, ba five, five bedrooms or whatever, right? Why? Code creep, regulations, water management rules, all kinds of environmental stuff, land costs. Look at labor costs. They're going up much faster in construction than most industries because the worker shortage in construction is really acute. And except for wood, which is plunging in price, commodity prices, inputs into homes are going up. Steel, aluminum, these are a little higher, not crazy higher, but a little higher. Worker wages are higher, the cost of money is higher, the cost of land is higher, regulations are higher, builders don't build at the bottom. They've given up building those low-end homes. On top of all this, there's been tax effects. Tax laws changed in December of 17, and they prevented you from deducting all your state property and income tax. It's capped at $10,000. So you look at expensive states where home prices are high, these are over a million dollars, and Colorado has some, more because of the, 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 the resort communities, right? Telluride, Beaver Creek, you know, and so on, right? But nonetheless, these are expensive states out here and here, and in those areas, owning a home is less advantageous than it was because it doesn't give you the tax relief it used to give you. So what are people like me doing, schnooks like me doing? I'm saying, I don't want to live in Maryland anymore and get beaten up and pooped upon by the government. No, I'm moving to Florida where there's no income tax. I, if I can't deduct it, I'm not paying it, right? And I'm angry. I pay a fortune in taxes and I can't deduct it. Well, screw you. I'm moving to Tennessee, no income taxes there. North, uh, 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 New, New Hampshire, no taxes there. The three states in the East Coast, there's no taxes, right? Move there, right? In the West, you can go to Wyoming. Let's go up to, uh, 30 miles, 50 miles north. No taxes in Wyoming, income taxes, right? Schools are crappy, but you can't have everything. Okay. In terms of existing homes, inventory is the best news out there. It's going up a little bit. We've had three straight years of year-over-year -year decline in inventory. It's going up a little. Not a lot. But it sure beats going down. So year over year, it's going up. You can see it here. This is by NIR, inventory. So a year, three years ago in May 15, from May 15 through 16 and 17, and most of 18, inventories were declining on a year over year basis. And now they're going up a little. And in certain cities, they're really going up. But they're going up for very small bases, right? They're going up, for example, you know, like in Seattle, they went from a four hours of inventory to six hours. Whoa, a 50% increase, but still way too few homes. Yeah, inventories are up in Denver. So friggin' what? There's still not enough out there, right? People don't want to sell their home because they don't know where they're going to live. And you can see the turning of the market in this graph. So look in January, last year, January 18, in red, thick graph, thick line, it was close to the top in terms of pending sales. Close to the top, close to the top, ooh, it's weakening. And by here, it's close to the bottom. So somewhere between March and September, the market flipped. Pending sales suddenly got much weaker compared to the prior decade of data. Something happened in the middle of the year, a light went off. And you saw pending sales weaken suddenly. Here's year over year pending sales. You can see. The decline here is palpable. It's been weak for a long time, below zero year over year. So it's shrinking, but suddenly it's shrinking more. Well, so you can see it here. Existing home sales. They peaked out in 2000 friggin' 17. How can it be? 2018 was the best year of the cycle. Wage growth was higher in 2018 than in 17. Job growth was better in 2018 than in 17. There was tax relief for most people in 2018 compared to 17. Take home pay as a result was higher. And existing home sales shrink again, WTF. This is, this is weird, it's not a healthy market. There's something wrong, there aren't enough homes being built. Inventories are too low, prices are going up too much and people are saying, ah, no thank you. Well, I, what do I think for this coming year? I think that they're flat to down by another two or three percent. Nothing much. 
but it can't be a good year because prices are still up, right? This is price increases. They're going up more slowly. They've gone from the upper sixes to the upper fours. And remember, wage growth, if you account for demographics, is 4%. Home price appreciation now is about 4.6. It's almost equal. So if you don't own a home, buying a home is not getting much further out of reach. This is a good thing. I want more inventory. I want to see price increases come down to 2 or 3%. Would let more people buy a house. We've complained there's no inventory. We need more inventory. In the long run, we need more homes built, but you can't have everything. This is first time mortgage ads. They're flat. This past week they were good, but they're flat because sales are flat. If this slide, if this slide is flat to declining, this slide can't be great. It can be a little better because price increases are still 5%, right? So even if volume is zero increase, price increases will help. But there's nothing spectacular happening. And if this is refi activity, if you have a refi shop, just buy them a gun, buy them a bullet, and every day at 3 o'clock they all play Russian roulette, and in a couple of weeks there's no one left, and everybody's happy. They'll look forward to the Russian roulette because the phone's not ringing because rates are generally going up. When rates go up, you have terrible refi, right? And that's just the way it is, right? There is some help here on HELOCs. If people want to withdraw a little bit of cash, so he cash out refi is now positive finally after years of negative. That's a good thing. And debt service payments as a function of disposable income are super low. So household balance sheets are strong. They are good. They really are. Households are still in good shape. Default rates among mortgages are super, super low. Credit cards, they're up a bit, auto loans up a bit, but, but, auto, but home, can, home loans are super low default because households can afford because rates are low, right? And there's no bubble out there. If home prices decline by 5 or 10%, God forbid, because of a recession, it will not lead to the mess we had last year, last year, last decade. Because people aren't overextended. Look at the FICO scores. If you look here, early part of last decade, there was massive deterioration in FICO scores. So, you know, you fogged the mirror, you got a loan, right? No, not anymore. Look at FICO. It's flatter than, again, super flat. Median buyer, bottom quartile, bottom decile. There's no deterioration. People who should get loans are getting loans. And if you have a low FICO, you're paying a higher rate. And that's the way it should be. It's higher risk for the bank or lending institution. Then they charge you more money. That's fine. So even if we have a, have a recession, we won't have this massive problem because we, we haven't had credit deterioration. And this problem ain't going to go away. Let me tell you, it ain't going to go away because we're hitting peak millennial. Home buying peaks out at age 31, 32. Maybe now because of student loans, 33 or 34. But millennials are youths, 4.3 million born who are now 21 and so on. 4.7, 4.8 million that are 26, 27 years old. In five years, they're going to want to own a home. They're now renting. They're going to want to buy. This problem will only persist for the foreseeable future. We need the builders to build more friggin' homes. But they're not. And last but not least, we have good household formation. One and a half million households a year are being formed. They have to live somewhere. There's going to be a need for homes. This problem will not go away. Last but not least, home ownership rates are trickling up a little. They'll never get back to there because that was because of credit deterioration, as we saw earlier. But it'll jump up another percentage point for sure, I think it will. So there's demand for homes, there's demographic demand for homes, builders aren't building enough homes, and so on and so forth. Let's quickly look around what's going on here, and then we'll wrap up, right? First, know where you live, for God's sake. You live in Colorado, one of the best growing states in the country. What is it ranked as? First, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth best. You're upper 90% just about of the country. 43 other states would gladly trade places with you. People are moving here because it's cheap and the taxes are low and the weather's decent. They're moving here because taxes are low and jobs are plentiful and weather's gorgeous. And they're moving here because they're masochists. Okay, I, I don't understand. I mean, no one in their right mind should move to California. I mean, prices are just too high, taxes are crazy. LA, they don't go to school in LA anymore. If you're a kid, you want to move to LA. Yeah, okay, fine. Look, look at the growth. States with fastest growth. Fa and year ending June 30, 18. 
total population growth, biggest. Colorado, eight. And you're not even a big state by population. You're five million people. Georgia's twice as big as you. North Carolina's twice as big as you, right? And you're growing very fast. You're the eighth most people moved into your state. Look at it another way, percentage increase, you're number seven. You're hot to trot here. You're a great state for people to move into. Your weather's good, your taxes are low, you can ski, you can cycle, you can do everything except go to the beach. It's a great state, my favorite state. Concurrent economic data is fine for Colorado. Leading economic data is fine for Colorado. You got no problems here, you really have no problems. Unemployment rates are crazy low along the front range. North to south, Fort Collins, Greeley, Boulder, Denver, and, and the Springs. They're all low. I mean, things suck a bit in the Springs, but hey, that's just the Springs. Raise your hands if you're from there. Oh, good, no one's from there. We can beat up on you, good. They aren't here to defend themselves, okay? This is good, they're higher here, but they're okay, 4%, a little above average. These places are crazy low. Who cares where? Greeley, I don't care. Boulder, they're all super low. It's good news. Look at your labor force growth. This is interesting. Look at the springs. I poofed on the springs a minute ago, but look at their labor force growth. That's pretty remarkable. What's going on? I'm not sure, but I think what's going on is they're the cheap solution. You can't afford Denver? I'll drive to the springs. People are moving there because it's relatively cheap. There's nothing to do, but at least it's cheap. <laughs> I'm kidding, it's beautiful Pikes Peak. I've been there. It's a gorgeous place. El Paso County, I get it. I'm just joking. But something happening there clearly. You can see it right here in your labor force is doing much, much better. The best of anybody right now is, is the springs, right? This is payroll growth. Look at the springs. That's friggin' crazy. So they're really doing very well, actually. They're turning it around because costs are higher elsewhere, right? Housing starts in Colorado, nothing much really happening here. Single fam flat, multi, single fam is red. Between red and blue is multi. It's flat too, high, but flat. So you're not doing any better. People moving in, you're not building more homes. That's why prices keep going up generally. And here's some data from Land Title, um, of one of the major sponsors of the event. The other one, major one being Community Banks Mortgage. Go see them, there's stuff out in the front. See John Paul, he'll help you out. Paul John, he'll help you out, right? Look at this. You're weakening a little. It's not a lot, it's just a little. Peak sales in 17, 67. Listings, a little higher now. So listings are up. That's okay, we need more inventory. That's fine, thank you. Month supply, going up, that's okay. People have more choice, they'll sell their home because they know they can buy a home. Price appreciation will come down. The froth will come off. This is okay. Days on market's up a little bit year over year. Nothing traumatic, but it's fine. This is not a recession. This is not a bad problem. This is a small increase in inventory. Sales are a little bit down. Hardly a disaster from 57 to 55 down by a few percent, just contain your depression here a little bit. Take a Xanax or something, calm down for friggin' sake, right? Sold units, look at this. If you compare last year to this year, right? Here, better this year, last year, 18, better than the year before, better, 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 flat, worse, 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 worse. So right there, middle of the year, the market turned over. A little, it was a little better the first six months to, to 17, and a little bit worse compared to 17 the last half. Nothing traumatic, just a little worse. But prices, they keep going up because there's still not enough inventory. People are moving in, job creation's good, and household formation's good. Last but not least, your prices are still going up too much. You need to build more homes. People wanna live here, but there's nowhere to live. Oh my God, I've talked way too long but you let me do it, it's your fault. You don't li walk up and leave, so I'm a victim. Kidding aside, my name, my cell number, website, Twitter handle, phone number, email address. I put out 70 words every day, gra no graphs, no charts, no ads, no links, no photos. Give me your business card. Go to, put your, right here, and drop it right here. Go to my website, econ70, and sign up there, or text the word bowtie, imagine that. As you see it, B-O-W-T-I-E, no hyphen between the words, no space, six letters straight to the five digit number 22828 you'll be prompted for an email address 
You'll hear from me every day until you die. <laughs> Think long and hard. I'll be outside taking questions. I'll be standing here for the next 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll take a short 13-minute break.